welcome everybody. Um, we'll kind of go ahead and get started here. I'm sure we'll have more people uh, coming in in the next couple of minutes, but to uh, kind of get things started, um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, this is our second uh, uh, discussion in the accessibility series that XRA is hosting in partnership with XR Access. Our first series was held in September and we focused on audio cues and how audio cues can assist uh, those with disabilities and improve XR accessibility. And today we're going to be talking about um, haptics. Um, so for introductions first, my name is Pierce Clark. I'm the program development manager at XR Association. Uh, we are a, a nonprofit association um, and our team, uh, the research and best practices team focuses on accessibility as well as several use cases of XR technologies, including education, healthcare. We also focus on standards. Uh, we're, uh, uh, Dylan Fox is also with XR Access and, and together we uh, hosted this event in September and also today. Uh, we are joined by uh, two guest speakers, um, Robert Crockett, uh, who is a biomedical engineer professor at Cal Poly and a specialist in development and commercialization of disruptive technologies and also Ashley Huffman who is an executive at Titan Haptics, who leads international marketing efforts and partnerships in VR, AR, gaming, and wearables. We did have a third presenter, Dr. Drew Jane, who's an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. However, he and his whole family came down with a case of COVID. Um, so we do have a couple of things to share from uh, uh, Dr. Jane, which we can share with the group after this call. Uh, but for right now, I'm going to pass it over to Dylan to kind of introduce himself, and then we'll hear from uh, uh, Robert and Ashley. Awesome. Thanks, Pierce. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Dylan Fox. I'm the head of community and outreach for XR Access. Um, if you haven't heard of us, we are a nonprofit research initiative out of Cornell Tech uh, focused on accessibility for uh, immersive technologies. Um, really excited to have uh, the discussion here today. Um, just a, a quick note on format. You know, we scheduled these for 90 minutes, which is a little bit longer than our normal seminars because we really want to give everybody the chance to contribute to the discussion. You know, we, we we're queuing it off here with our lead speakers um, because we wanted to have uh, some, you know, grade A experts on hand to, to give us some things to, to kind of bounce ideas off of. But um, really, if you have uh, really interesting ideas or contributions in this space, please do share them and let's make it part of the discussion. Um, we want to make sure that we come out of this conversation today with, uh, you know, some best practices, some things that we can share with the community, some things, uh, some ways we can let people concretely make their XR experiences more accessible. Um, and in case we haven't mentioned, we're going to have uh, 10 minutes for each of our speakers. I think we're going to play just a, a quick snippet of uh, Drew's video that he shared with us, and then we're going to open it up for discussion. Um, feel free to go ahead and put uh, questions in the chat at any time. We will be um, making sure to uh, get those out there. Um, I have a request here for the uh, captions. Uh, if there's any chance we can get those in sentence case. So uh, John, as our captioner here, if, if you'd be kind enough to, to try to use sentence case, that'd be really helpful. Um, okay, so without any further ado, uh, Bob, take it away. All right, thank you, Don. Hello, everybody, uh, Bob Crockett. I, it was mentioned that I'm a biomedical engineering professor, but actually I'm here today in my capacity as, as co-founder of a company called Haptex. We produce a, a glove that you wear in virtual reality that gives you haptic feedback. I'm super excited to be here to, to talk about this topic today. Uh, in fact, if you see me looking down, I've got my notepad. I intend to, to take a bunch of notes uh, with this conversation because this is not only a very important uh, topic, but it's also something that, that it's a Technology is advancing so fast, things are moving so rapidly. We really want to make sure that, that we have a seat at the, at the table for this really important conversation and that some of the feedback that, that we receive actually makes its way into the, the sort of products that we and other companies produce. So I'll start off just by, by uh, setting the context. Uh, we have a limited amount of time for me to talk and, and most of this is about interaction, but it's important that you understand uh, why I'm here, uh, of, of the many different haptics companies, uh, we represent a particular type of haptics that really is striving for as natural a touch as possible. 
And as Ashley and I have, have talked about in, in other podcasts, there's room for every single type of haptic device out there in, in this uh, field. There's room for symbolic haptics that are very, very simple, low cost devices that, that have maybe even a single uh, tactile point per finger. Uh, we're kind of on the other end of the spectrum. It's an expensive product. Uh, and right now it's geared at enterprise market. Uh, our goal has always been to try to, to do whatever it takes to create a sensation of natural touch. And what that means is, is that when you put on the VR headset and you have our gloves on, you reach out, you interact with an object as if that object was solid. The way that we do that is all with pneumatics. Uh, if, you, if you're going to try to, to imitate what feels like an actual contact with an actual object, you have to push into the skin quite a bit. And so our, our technology uses essentially little tiny balloons, 133 individual tactile pixels, primarily located at the fingertips, but also across the palm. Uh, and, and that's what gives you that pattern of, of touch that your brain would expect when you interact with a coffee mug, for example. The other part of, of a natural haptics experience is force feedback. So if you uh, are trying to, to interact with an object in virtual reality, unless you have something that physically stops your hand from going through that virtual coffee mug, you're gonna feel like a ghost. Uh, it's not going to register in, in your brain as a, as a natural contact. So our system, in addition to the, to the tactile pixels on the underside of your hand, uh, we also have a series of, of tendons on the, on the back of the hand uh, that will physically prevent your hand from going through a, an object. So in virtual reality, when it's detected that you're contacting an object in the virtual world, your hand will, will be stopped in the correct uh, orientation location, and you will feel the tactile sensation uh, at a high enough pixel density that makes it feel like you're touching that object. So uh, what I'm really excited to talk about today is, is not only the natural, everybody, when they start thinking about haptics and, and, uh, and people helping people with disabilities, the natural inclination is to first look at our system and think of Braille, because if you look at one of the interior pads of, of our system, it, it looks like it's a soft Braille system. Uh, and indeed, that is possible. It's very similar in, uh, in its performance and capabilities to, to what would be a Braille reader. Uh, but I'm really excited to talk about not only visual impaired, but, but also, uh, for example, just to give food for thought, we have a, a, a customer of our product who is very interested in using our, our gloves uh, for a deafblind individual uh, to, who's a programmer to be able to, to visualize very complex data using haptic feedback. So um, not just the, the traditional extension of, of Braille, but being able to, to touch data structures uh, as part of a, of a coding exercise. Uh, and in terms of uh, therapeutic use for people with, with uh, cognitive disabilities, uh, for people with mobility issues, uh, the, the whole spectrum of anybody who can benefit from haptics is something that, that we have some case studies on. But up until now, we haven't had the hardware to be able to really get it out there in the world and have this sort of conversation. So really excited to be here, looking forward to the conversation. Great, thanks Bob. Um, really interesting information about how haptics works and some of the specs on how those gloves operate in virtual environments. Uh, the therapeutic uses of haptics and how people can ultimately use this technology is really encouraging. Um, but from here, I'll pass it off to Ashley, take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much. I'm going to share my screen. I've got a uh, sort of probably too long of a presentation, but I, I promise I will try to um, get it all in. Just give me one sec. All right. Y'all can see. Good. Great. Beautiful. Okay. Awesome. So um, who am I? Um, I'll provide some background on who I am. Uh, so my name is Ashley. I love haptics. Um, I've been called the queen of haptics, which is a strange title, but I am a self-proclaimed haptics hype woman. Um, I'm the co-founder of the newsletter All Things Haptics, which is a monthly round of, of all the things happening in the haptics space, including academia, patents, and new tech. I'm also the co-founder of the Haptics Club podcast, which is a bi-weekly series, which features some of the coolest uh, people, haptics geeks in the space. And uh, we interviewed Bob, which is awesome. Huge fan of Bob and, and the Haptics Gloves. Um, and you can find the Haptics Club podcast on Spotify and Apple, Apple podcast. Um, but 
in Titan, I lead XR partnerships in gaming, um, and we develop, we're a haptic motor company. We develop motors for smartphones, consoles, and touchscreens, and I'll go a bit deeper into that. But um, I'm sandwiched between the speakers of their doctors. I'm not a doctor. I do not play a doctor on TV, but what I bring to the table in terms of the conversation is I've got insights from a kind of greater industry, a business side, product side, and from a, from a, a startup side. Just looking at definitions, definitions is a great way to start. Um, haptics is a technology that provides, you know, a, an experience of touch by applying forces and vibrations and motions to the user. Some kind of key points in this is many folks don't really know what haptics are, um, but they, they know what it is when you describe a gaming controller that rumbles or their phone that buzzes. And really, haptics unlock a uh, device to human communication. And we have so many devices these days, um, and a lot of devices are now becoming buttonless, and, you know, in a world where we don't want to have people just button mashing and not having any kind of feedback at all, haptics is a brilliant way to do confirmations, like when you're typing on a keyboard. It's also a powerful tool in terms of XR, unlocking storytelling, immersion, subtle environmental cues, um, even experiencing music in new ways. And of course, designing haptics is both a science and an art form, um, which Bob mentioned. You have to understand the human body, how it works, what it likes, what it doesn't like. And of course, sometimes you're tricking the body into thinking that it's um, you're, you know, it's doing something that it's that's not actually happening. And in terms of accessibility, that's really important because you've got different literally like hand sizes and grip strengths and abilities. And then the industry as a whole, um, which is really important to mention, is haptics is a billion dollar industry. So it's pretty substantial. It was 9.2 billion in 2021, and it's expected to be 23.8 billion in 2030. Uh -oh. Haptics tech in the consumer space um, really hasn't changed too much um, in the last 50 years. It has in industry and, and in other areas, but in the consumer space and products, it hasn't. Um, so for consumers, it still means that deep rumble that called an ERM spinning motor in their game controllers. Also the high pitched buzzing in the in their phones, like the LRA motors, which you find in your um, VR controllers and your smartphones. And one of the reasons why I'm actually passionate about haptics um, spawned from Titan and being able to explore this space even more. There's just so much we can do. Uh, we developed an advanced haptic motor called Tack Hammer, which is uh, based on solid state uh, magnetic suspension. So if you think of it like a maglev train, my GIF isn't working, which is embarrassing because it's easier to tell that it's a, a linear magnetic ram. It describes what it does. It's linear, it's magnetic, and it, and it rams. Um, and the kind of most powerful part. Um, the exciting part is that you can do effects from the deep rumbles to the uh, high pitch buzzing. So it really does create like a symphony of haptics in one unit. And as a gamer um, perspective, as someone like completely obsessed with Hogwarts at this point, um, probably to like a terrible degree, my productivity has failed. Don't tell anyone. I should not say this on a recording. Um, but one of my favorite parts of uh, this is like gaming is it provides such an immersive experience. And there's so many ways to innovate outside of gaming and entertainment and music and training um, where advanced haptics kind of solve problems, um, but it's it can be done in such creative ways. Consumer-wise, haptics are in a lot of interesting technologies in 99% of smartphones. They're in uh, headsets and wearables, blasters, suits, headphones, belts, uh, vests, controllers. I could probably spend an entire 10 minutes just describing these, so I won't. Just talking about trends at a high level, um, VR gloves were super popular at CES this year, 2023. Haptex was featured. They were doing some really cool, um, like an exhibition stunt um, involving lots of people uh, with Jenga, like really cool, immersive. Uh, the Haptics was there with their developer glove, uh, Contact CI, AI Silk, so many. Um, so I think that speaks to um, the accessibility and the ability to have gloves that really kind of broach an area of um, development of immersion that um, is just is ripe for innovation and um, opportunity. Gesture is also an area that's important to mention. You may have seen some of the um, ultra leap technology. It's uh, mid-air haptics seen in retail stores and uh, displays also being used in automotive. Um, but the company Ultraleap is also behind the hand tracking module um, in XR VR headsets like Lynx. And uh, we recently interviewed their CEO um, and he mentioned the importance of haptics in the space, which is really curious because as a company kind of pioneering the XR field, the hand-free future, um, hearing him mention that haptics is like a critical part of this, I think is really important for the industry as a whole. 
And then last but not least, a really big one of the past year is multi-actuator uh, trends in XR. So PSVR2, um, Metaverse Pro, Pro Controllers, um, they all have more than one actuator. So typically technologies only contain one motor uh, that does one thing in particular, but these companies are starting to see the value of incorporating things like triggers like you'd see in your old Xbox controller, um, touch pads like your uh, laptop, and then buzzing like your smartphone. I wanted to share some examples of where I've seen um, Haptic Shine in uh, XR. Uh, one of the companies we work with is called Striker VR. They do an amazing job at uh, disconnecting the real world from um, the virtual world. Uh, they blur the lines completely. They have this peripheral that you can see in this photo here that um, really makes you feel like you're, you know, a badass in Terminator, um, you know, just wrecking. Like you become the that kind of like action hero that you've seen in movies as kids, which is really fun. So it's a location-based entertainment company. Um, and you've probably seen a lot of the videos in the space where it's like a, a fight or flight type of situation. So someone's so into it because of all these different elements, the sound, the audio, the video, the haptics, that there's like someone's booking it and running and the other person's like standing and fighting. And haptics, of course, are... Uh, also epic at replicating real life experiences. We've seen this with training. People use our haptics for things like uh, military training to mimic you know, realistic gunshots um, and things like recoil. Speaking of the training front, um, we recently supported Hackathon at TU Delft uh, University uh, overseas, and they created um, a really insightful uh, project to solve real problems. Uh, the workshop highlighted some key use cases that I wanted that are like related to XR or could be leveraged in XR that I wanted to share. Um, and it kind of treats haptics as a superpower, not like the super evil uh, kind, but like the superhero kind. Uh, one of the teams embedded uh, in a construction helmet, they had um, proximity sensors and haptics together. And uh, what that helmet was able to do was to let the person know that there's people or some object coming towards them. And based on the speed and distance, it would send them different effects. So varying levels of haptics. And you can imagine that this is kind of like a spidey sense um, where it can benefit someone even in public who's wearing a headset or someone who has immunity issues or someone who um, just needs like personal space. This is like a great way to leverage haptics as kind of that kind of like superpower. Another fun one that's really common in XR is the uh, guidance information. So the ability to uh, help you use haptics to help you navigate. So this particular uh, wearable device um, was that you map to a certain place. It allows you to actually, it buzzes when you need to turn left or turn right or do a U-turn or to stop. And the team showed how you can use this for locating uh, places of interest. So that's like a store or a monument. There's like an item on your to-do list that's been lingering and it lets you know you're really close to that store. So I'm imagining that this paired with glasses would really turn um, life and like everyday activities um, into more like a video game. And on that note, talking more of like an industry wide um, industry side of things, it's not a coincidence that the most popular uh, VR game happens to be Beat Saber. Um, it has absolutely enchanting haptics, uh, which is based on like the timing at which you hit um, the based on the song and hitting the blocks exactly. It's really like a clever way to hone your skills and help you perfect your skills without you really knowing it. And of course, you know, people say VR is dead, but um, according to industry analysts, you know, VR, AR, MR is like the fastest growing space in haptics um, compared to other markets. So I think all of the challenges that it represents are just opportunities waiting to happen. More on the industry side. Um, talk about accessibility, it's become a major part of product narratives, which is really exciting to see. Uh, PSVR 2, which recently came out, um, they mentioned this as part of like the headset and the controllers that they have all these types of accessibility needs in mind, thinking about the, the why, why things are the size they are, why the, the shape they are. Um, and you can see by the quote there that, you know, the reason why is it's for, it's for reasons of accessibility. It's also reason for business. It's good business to have more customers and to make people play longer. So that's a key solve. This image here is a controller that um, Sony released called Project Leonardo. They released it at CES. And it's another good example of how companies are creating technology specific for accessibility in mind for someone who needs to adapt a controller based on how they like to play. Does it need to be flat? Does it need to be only two buttons? Can they? You can you only use a joystick? 
Xbox did something similar. Um, I've provided a lot, the QR code here, which is a um, goes to their guide, which is a great resource in terms of um, using like what are the benefits of, benefits of using haptics in games. When is it a you know not great? Um, thinking about people who maybe have pain or discomfort with haptics, so definitely check that out. And last but not least, um, the Last of Us video game is an example of a company that's leveraging haptics in a new way for accessibility. They have uh, haptic effects, a, a unique haptic effect that they use for dialogue, so it emits. Um, vibrations for the PS uh, DualSense controller and uh, players who are hard of hearing or deaf can feel more of the elements of the game. Another great example of accessibility is the Electronic Arts, who last December uh, announced that they have this new, um, if you haven't done Electronic Arts, they have a gaming, their gaming studio, they've done really cool stuff like Need for Speed, FIFA, uh, Dead Space. They announced an uh, addition to their patent investment portfolio, which is part of their accessibility patent pledge, which aims to further diversify inclusivity through uh, disability and accessibility. What this really means it, um, is a pretty way of saying they're basically listing certain patents that you can leverage without fear of repercussion of litigation, which is really cool. So that's a great dedication. So things like the implementation of a movable control pad on a, a touch enabled device is something you can leverage as a company and leverage as a person to create devices, which is a really, it's a great step in the right direction. Um, last point on the industry side, um, there are, you know, it's a competitive market. Haptics has been a competitive space for a long time. It's been run by industry giants who have built big moats around tech, software, and they make it difficult for new incumbents to come in. Um, there's efforts by people like the Haptics Industry Forum who create um, standard bodies for different industries just to utilize standards in a way that creates broader adoption for haptics tech. And, and it's greater for the, the market overall. It's easier to come in. It's easier to understand um, based on if you're an automotive XR uh, VR, et cetera. And then just a, a side note, um, I know I'm probably going over time, a side note is um, one of the coolest places to find um, interesting XR tech, interesting accessibility tech is academia and hackers and makers. They That's where probably I find the coolest things happening. Studies on the value of haptics in XR and gaming, uh, chemical haptics and wearables that create diverse effects like you know, pain, tickling, and cold. Um, so I think if you know these are the types of folks who um, they have a lot of understanding of accessibility and they're bridging things by just asking big questions. Uh, key takeaways from this haptics in consumer XR is uh, gaining a lot of traction. Um, accessibility is still a problem in haptics uh, altogether. Haptics are hard. It's hard to integrate. It's hard to develop. Um, it's a it's a big uh, uh, ecosystem. And of course, um, haptics is hard because there's still players in the space who built boats and that kind of sucks. But at the same time, new innovative ideas are plenty um, if you know where to look and you um, are just curious. And these are just some resources, um, a lot of the stuff I'm working on um, to help you out. Haptic Labs is a great tool for understanding haptic design. Uh, my newsletter, if you're just curious about all the things happening in um, the haptics ecosystem, our podcast, we feature, like I said, people like Bob who have just, you know, years of knowledge um, and are just uh, uh, open to sharing um, everything that they're going on, the challenges and opportunities and how they see the future. And of course, Titan, you know, it's as a company that creates motor technology, it's in our best interest to help you uh, create like groundbreaking epic experiences. So if you're curious about playing with haptics, like definitely reach out. That's it. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ashley. That was an awesome intro to haptics. Um, I'm gonna go ahead now and play just a, a brief clip from our third speaker, uh, who, as we mentioned, is, unfortunately couldn't make it here today. Um, so Dr. Dhruv Jain is an assistant professor at University of Michigan Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, his research lies in the field of human-computer interaction and accessibility, and includes, among other areas, increasing XR accessibility using tools and toolkits to allow developers and end users to augment visual or auditory information in XR with haptic feedback. His overarching aim is to achieve a future where accessibility will be integrated by default in emerging devices and media, uh, which is definitely something that, that we share here at XR Access. Um, so I'm going to be sharing uh, a little clip from his talk, and I'll share this in the link in the chat as well, uh, towards sound accessibility in virtual reality, uh, which is an ICMI 2021 paper talk. And let me go ahead and share my screen. Here we 
Okay. Okay, can everybody see this okay? All right. Nobody's saying no, so let's let's hear it. Hello, I'm DJ, a final year PhD student from the University of Washington. This work was done as part of my summer internship at Microsoft Research, looking at sound accessibility in virtual reality. An example of sound accessibility is shown here in this background image, which shows text representation of water flowing and footsteps down from a popular VR game, Minecraft. Okay, so let's begin with an introduction. Sound is a very critical component of the VR world. It can provide critical information, such as approaching animal footsteps, can increase realism, such as through a wind blowing down, or add aesthetics to a VR app, such as using a water spill sound. However, for many deaf and our hearing people, these sounds and the information they convey are not accessible, which may limit the VR experience. They may make critical cues in games or may not feel fully immersed. We are exploring how to make sounds in VR accessible to DHS people. But typically, we contribute a design space to map sounds to visual and haptic feedback in VR and to exploration of the design space, using it to contextualize the state of the art on sound accessibility and develop new VR sound accessibility prototypes. Before I go into details of this, let me quickly cover some relevant past work. Researchers have explored visual and haptic substitutes of everyday sound for DHS users, but this approach has not been a German for virtual reality. Now, VR is a radically different environment containing both the fictional world and a exaggerated representation of the real world. Some VR games have begun incorporating initial accessibility features for DHS people, but these are one-off commercial efforts which have not been formally explored in the literature. Our focus instead is on making mainstream VR accessible, which leads to lower development costs, increased availability, and better social acceptability over specialized experiences. Okay, so coming back to the outline, Let's start with the okay. I'm going to cut off the the video there, just so we have more time for live discussion. But um, hopefully that gives everybody uh, a little sneak preview of uh, kind of Drew's work. Um, he said he's happy to answer questions asynchronously, um, so I will go ahead and share his email here as well. Um, really encourage folks to read the paper because it is uh, it, awesome, awesome applications. Um, so with that, I think we can open it up for discussion. Um, I again welcome people to, uh, you know, come on video, turn on your mic, introduce yourself. Um, you know, I'll be keeping an eye on uh, people raising their hand using the reaction system um, in Zoom. So if you have something you want to bring up, feel free to do that. Uh, and we can start off, I think, with some questions that have already come in. Um, so first, and again, I'll, I'll put these first to our panelists, um, but if anybody else has a, a suggestion, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we had two questions uh, submitted before the presentation uh, from Nuno Nebecker. Uh, I'm wondering where the state of the art is as far as haptics resolution. Uh, I haven't used a PS5 DualSense controller, but I've heard very good things. Is that the current leader? I can hear it simulate. I hear it can simulate rain, but could the technology in it simulate surface texture uh, in VR controllers? Um, I'll maybe leave it off first to uh, to Bob. I know we just talked a little bit about kind of the res different resolutions available in different devices. Yeah. So. Uh... Thanks for that great question. And, and we have been pushing towards what we consider to be the, the, the highest resolution practical. So the system that we have right now has a, has a spacing of pixels on the, on the fingertip of uh, about, about two millimeters or so, uh, center to center. We can go higher density. Braille, uh, as an example, has, has higher density, smaller pixels or smaller dot sizes. Uh, that's all possible. We haven't, haven't done that yet in our product. 
what's interesting though is uh, when done right. So uh, we're, we're typically used to, to having a very rich visual environment that goes along with haptics in, uh, for our customers for, for high-end simulations, for example. Uh, but it's not limited to, to just visual. Uh, if, if haptics is done right, if the other cues that the user is receiving at the same time are complementary and, and don't conflict uh, and cause confusion, your body is so good at, at filling in mis missing pieces of information uh, that if you look at the at the biomedical literature, for example, there's a very well-defined uh, reference point that's that's the two-point threshold. Which, if you take two needles and move them closer and closer together, what's the point at which you can't distinguish uh, them as two individual points? Uh, that's much much smaller than than what our pixel size is right now. But interestingly, you don't notice that. So higher resolution is important up to a point. But what's more important is that the, the whole environment that surrounds the, the, the user, uh, whether that is visual uh, or other type of sensory information, uh, can, can make or break the difference between your mind accepting that as very high resolution by filling in missing pieces uh, or being really pissed off and, and having the whole thing feel very uncanny. Uh, so I would say that, that you know, the, the approach we're taking, pneumatics, is one way to do it. And we're, we can get down much higher resolution as the use case requires it. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, and that's not the only way to do things. So I, I guess I'll pass it off to Ashley to describe other types of, of technologies that also have the promise of getting very, very close spaced uh, proximity for tactile. Yeah, awesome. I think, yeah, the 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 glowing answer is yes, the, the dual sense is the de facto kind of um, haptics benchmark, similar to how uh, PlayStation um, PSVR is becoming that for virtual reality. Um, I've heard that as one of our questions on the haptics club is, you know, yeah, what's the best haptic experience? And like 90% of the time we get this answer, whether you're, you know, it's a, from, from deep academia to the CEO of a company to an engineer. Um, and it's, it can be a frustrating answer only because, um, you know, as someone in haptics, you want more of these types of experience to exist, but it is a truly amazing experience. And I think the reason why it is um, the de facto is one uh, portion of this is that you know Sony has ability to invest into these types of activities marketing and um, technology wise they're one of the few companies doing multi actuator including headset haptics and the uh, controller haptics but at the same time other companies um, are facing the fact that uh, the development time is competing for you know tuning sound, uh, making the visuals as perfect as they possibly be, having to spend time to create um, like cross platform um, abilities uh, is critical. So the time that is spent to design a haptic experience is not one that everyone can take the time to do. And I think the the reason why you're seeing um, kind of like the more limited uh, experience is that this legacy it's just a, a limitation of legacy technology it's an ERM motor is meant to deep rumble and that's what it does really well it was designed to do that it's not designed to do anything else and it physically can't at the same time an LRA motor is designed for a phone to be like a dog whistle of um of haptics it's meant to capture your attention and that's what it does really well and that's there are certain kind of limitations that can't be bridged for that so they're like you know companies like Titan myself, we are looking to help kind of support these new types of experiences. But at the same time, as um, Bob was alluding to, it's there's a magic of when you bring together um, all of your senses that you can, there's ways you can kind of trick it into thinking something else is happening. Um, and I'm trying to think of a quote from one of my haptics club um, co-workers, uh, Eric from Razor, but he's essentially mentioning that uh, it's it's the art of it is being able to create an experience that is what you're trying to describe. It has nothing to do with what you're actually doing, like painting with a paintbrush. There, it's the tactile experience is completely different than what it is in, in the haptic experience. But if you can bridge it with sound and visuals, that's that's where the magic happens. And your brain is just like that's just enough to make me think that it's happening. And it's only when you have missed timings or uh, just like overt haptics design that's aggressive where you start to see that um, that ability to connect the dots slip. Awesome. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, I see a question from Larry Goldberg here. Hey, folks. Um, I was working with some of the uh, startups in the field of using haptics for guidance and wayfinding. And they were using these patterns of, of uh, tactile, very rudimentary uh, patterns of haptic feedback 
um, with uh, uh, one beep or one or two or three in a row. And I thought this would be a good stage in the early days to think about a, a common language for haptics. Uh, what I asked was such a thing as hapmoji, the idea that we all kind of know what emojis are doing and what they mean. Could there be something similar for haptics where everyone knows that almost like Morse code, that with a certain pattern of dots, it means one thing, turn left, turn right. Uh, and it would probably have to be something that would be across industry that people would adopt the same patterns that would mean the same thing. I'm wondering if everyone, anyone's ever done something like that. Yeah, I love that. I think that's um, just one of those things that it just makes so much sense. And why hasn't this happened before? Um, I think it's a, if you look at it from like a company perspective, the reason is like it goes back to like the building moats. So everyone kind of does things differently, similar to mobile phones. You see how Samsung and Apple are like, it's the same damn thing, but they do things so differently, whether it's this, the, how you you know touch the keyboard, how you interact, you swipe left, this one you swipe down. But I think there people are trying, uh, Larry, which is great. So I mentioned the Haptics Industry Forum, which is one place where companies and academia and people can come together to um, at least like work towards an effort. So there's an understanding of like what something should be like and creating benchmarks. At the same time, there are people who are working on something like a Haptics Wikipedia to help create kind of the sound bits, like to create some kind of idea around like what this should feel like. Um, so th there is hope that it's happening, but at the same time, it's it's one of those conversations where everyone has such a different opinion. Um, if you talk to David Parisi, who's well known in the the haptics industry of you know about ha haptics language, ooh, he will he will talk to you for an hour about how he uh, how he thinks that's a, a crazy idea, and you know he wants like it's it's something that we're not quite as capable of doing. So, but that's a, that's a great question. That's a great idea, Larry. And uh, yeah, Daryl, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I just wanted to note that I had a very similar, um, I guess, observation as Larry around that in terms of interacting with companies that are trying to do basic communication with haptics or essentially kind of delving into that area of sensory substitution when you're looking at low vision or blindness and you're trying to interpret spatial, you know, the, the spatial reality around you or maybe actually navigate from A to B. All of these things, there's so much that you can do in terms of, um, you know, using audio as a as a cue, and coupling that with haptics is really really compelling, either you know, with audio or even haptics alone. But it feels like there absolutely needs to be at least a rudimentary kind of base language that people follow. And the the sense that I was having is that if you're relying on haptics. In a, in a real world scenario and you're in meaning you're relying on it and that you don't maybe have that primary sense of sight you need to know when a system want, needs you to stop critically like you're about to walk into traffic or a pole or something that's going to that's going to harm you you need to have something that is absolute um not to be it, that won't be misunderstood and will be absolutely under you know like i must stop don't take another step that kind of thing, it's like the stop sign. Like everyone knows the the, the red octagonal stop sign. You, you know what you do, you don't have to read it. You know what that means. We need that equivalent in a, in a haptic language. And I, my curiosity was around how, like, how basic or sophisticated could you get with that? Because it feels like obviously the more sophisticated that you get with language, then it becomes much like you have a cognitive overload issue, you have a you have a learning curve issue, you have all these kind of other things that get introduced. But at the very basic foundation, it feels like we have to have at least some notion of commonality around critical things, at least in the context of, of wayfinding and spatial reality for, for accessibility. And I'll just add add to that in the sense that, you know, we're we're focusing on on gloves. What's what's interesting is is there's that whole language that you, that you could talk about with with a variety of devices that offer that that sort of, of haptic language, uh, and generally that can be a, a planar language. Uh, it doesn't have to be associated with with the hands, uh, and you could talk about resolution and data communication. I think when you bring the hands into it. The extra dimension that you get, and again, you have to be careful of, of overload, but but uh, the extra dimension you have available is shape, uh, where you really now 
can can take a, a haptic language and move it into the third dimension and grasp objects or feel the shape of objects. And so I think that's that's an interesting dimension that may or may not be a part of the, the toolkit for this sort of, of haptic language. Yeah, this is Dylan. It it definitely seems to me that it's going to be a have to be a mixture of kind of some type of established language and then each application teaching users its own specific language, right? I think we see that all the time in video games, for example. There's some things that are you know in common, but then others that are unique to the specific uh, applications that are that are being used here. Um, one thing I, I would really love to, to talk more about is this idea of haptics for sensory substitution, right? So, because, you know, we oftentimes think of haptics as uh, being used to augment uh, visual or audio symbol uh, signals. But for somebody who doesn't have their hearing or doesn't have their vision or either, um, haptics can represent a really important, uh, you know, form of communication, right? They can be used to, to uh, indicate separate types of information than what's coming over through the video or audio bands. Um, so I would love to hear from from folks here. Uh, what are what would you say are some of the, the best practices of using haptics as a substitute for another sense? And again, I, I'd encourage uh, folks who are, are kind of lurking in the background here to to come up, put on, you know, put on your video, put on your audio. Um, we really want this to be a, a community discussion, not just kind of a, a, an expert panel. I do I just want to actually add one quick thing, maybe not as an expert in or a best practice here, but an observation in that. Um, so I, I am visually impaired. And one of the things that that I've recognized over time is that is my my preference is like it's if somebody needs to get my attention and I'm not able to I'm not seeing them, them just like putting a hand on my shoulder or just some kind of very subtle connection is has high degree of meaning and it really helps orient myself in, in terms of like where that person is, you know, so I, I'm also deaf in my right ear, so I can't triangulate audio. So if someone says my name, I don't know where they're, where they're, where they're coming from. So a simple touch has so much, conveys so much meaning. And the idea that haptics can become more human instead of like a, like a, just an industrial kind of vibration, but actually if you feel like you're being, it capped on the shoulder and it and it feels authentic in that way. That's a pretty incredible experience. And then figuring out how to do that in the real world, or I guess in the virtual world, it makes sense, makes really good sense as well. But it just like that to me feels like where is a big leap. If if we can get to that point where you can replicate a the the feeling of of just like a, a human contact seems really good. Yeah, that's a great point, Daryl. And uh, we had a very related question um, from the chat. Uh, it was asked, are there any existing projects or is anyone aware of any projects involving haptics in uh, immersive environments with the aim of facilitating communication between people uh, with disabilities and the abled individuals? I'm wondering if anybody is aware of anything or has any insight to offer on that. Hi, everyone. Closely related, closely related to that is the work that I'm doing um, in musical environments. Um, I'm using passive haptics rather than active haptics. So it's something that hasn't been really discussed here. I think we've got a very technological based um, wearable technologies here, whereas I'm interested in almost the converse of that, how audio can facilitate the visual world uh, of the extended and the um, the, the real world, how surfaces can be augmented by virtual reality to create a sense of pressure and interaction with virtual objects. Take, for example, a piano that may overlay a, a hard surface or a drum pad that affords some sort of bounce without your hand going through a through this uh, visual artifact. And it has a lot of uh, p potential life I'm finding for people who need guidance in the way that they interact in the virtual world 
and so it's kind of I know it's kind of like a little bit of a, a curveball in regards to what we're talking about, what you guys are talking about here in, in the using the technology to, to as wearable devices. But how I'm interested in finding if there's anyone here that is is looking at um, how technology can augment the real world and the haptic feedback that solid artifacts around us can give, and how that gives us new affordances um, in our interactions in the extended reality. I don't want to stop the conversation either. <laughs> no, it's an interesting point. I want to give folks a chance to respond to it. And then I think we had uh, Shiri Asimkot, um, the Extra Access Executive Director. I was going to say something. And then I see George uh, for Soglu has his hand up. Uh, but first, take any reactions to, to Damien's point here. I'll just say, Damien, if you've got a link to what you're working on, that'd be great if you can share it in the comment section so we can take a look um, and even dive deeper. I'm also curious too, Damien, if you have any um, uh, examples that uh, the group may benefit from definitions of passive versus active haptics and what that looks like in practice. Okay, a passive haptic is something that is, um, I think the, the famous examples are the using of a cup um, where you can, to augment the realistic uh, and immersive experiences that, that a cup is overlaid um, or even underlaid, the virtual cup is underlaid with an actual cup or, and there's been tests done to see how far from a cup can you make an object to feel as if it is real in your hand. And of course, um, and so my own studies as part of it has been how can a hard surface afford somebody with maybe like cerebral palsy, the, the passive haptic is a tactile surface that doesn't vibrate in your hand, but the moment touching, the moment retouch of a hard surface, because of the visual predominance of uh, virtual and extended realities, can really trick the mind into thinking that you have played a note because uh, you're getting the audio response back. You may be getting a a, a visual response from the the virtual keyboard that gives you that. That sense of interaction, which um, uh, which is passive, it doesn't have any powers, motors, sensors uh, that will that interacts with you. It is all of that processing is done in your own imagination uh, in real time. And so, passive haptics are, um, I think, maybe a very real and accessible uh, set, a way of interacting um, in, in the real world because we're surrounded by surfaces we are surrounded by what cameras in the future will be able to pick up that we can through machine learning um and, and improved machine learning and all of the database of uh, of objects that will come in the future of how of how artificial intelligence can pick up the the, the local environment and that how that can then facilitate um, whether it's navigation, whether it's the placement of, um, you know, uh, ways of making choices in, or communication devices that a lot of people um, use physical devices for, but how those are overlaid in the virtual world by just using onboard cameras and uh, and our imaginations, really. Perfect. Thank you, Damien. And uh, a question from uh, George. Um, so quick introduction. Um, I work for a company called OVR Technology. Uh, we create a device that lets you um, actually smell in XR. Um, and so I guess my question is more from like a more philosophical perspective on how we actually see haptics. Um, cause we see our devices sort of broadening haptics potential because we render odor, but we don't exactly render vibrations, even though we may use vibrations to help render that odor. So I'm just kind of curious how, you know, haptics would usually think of like the sensations of feeling things, but how would you guys wrap your, or I guess your input on using haptics to render other things like odor? 
and how that might fit into this puzzle. I, I can't speak to how haptics can help render odor. That's a really interesting question. I never even thought of that. So I'm gonna be thinking about that in the shower later on today. But, uh, but the other way around, we've objectively seen that time and time again, that if you add another dimension to haptics or to VR, it's not a linear increase in believability, it's exponential. Uh, so adding the smell to a simple haptic experience especially if it's if it's well synced to a, a visual experience. And that really could be any combination of senses. I, we're, we're most uh, familiar with the haptic and, and visual connection in our company. Um, but it really does, what it does is it, it takes the pressure off the other uh, devices, if you're solving this by technology, to, to make the, the immersion, the sense of embodiment into that environment or into that scenario so much more believable. So, so we have seen that just by, you know, again, back to, to what we know best of the, the gloves. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, tactile and force feedback. If you reduce one of the modes of that, if you take away the force feedback and keep the full tactile or vice versa, it drops by an order of magnitude, the, the level of, of immersion. Uh, and so, so I'm really looking forward to the day where we combine the, the high quality haptic experience, high quality meaning just well-designed haptic experience, uh, with with smell because what that's going to do is it's going to make it make life easier for the for the haptics providers. It's going to to let that immersion really take over to a greater de degree. And, and I don't have any quantitative data to back that, but I've just seen it firsthand in, in our early experiments. Yeah, I, I guess more of a like a philosophical question: Would we still consider that haptics, or since we're dealing with another sense, would we? call this something else that would encompass brought more broadly speaking these things or is it all would it all just fall under haptics like more of like a it's a semantics game but i'm just curious mm -hmm. how you guys feel about that we want you on our team we're, we're going to call it haptics. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. yeah it's funny i was at um a haptics dedicated event an industry event um it's called smart haptics and this came up as a topic um, and honestly, it, it caused the most fights I've ever seen in a group of professional individuals, I, like ever. Um, like, you know, half the room is like, there's no way we're considering smell haptics. It's not haptics. Like, it you know, has nothing to do with touch. Haptics is all about touch. And the other half is like, but it's all about your senses. It's all about immersion. So, um, uh, it, yeah, it's just like, I, I don't know much about the subject. I've been dying to try your technology. Um, so I definitely want to do that. And I'm kind of curious about others' opinion in this room um, of like, do you consider it haptics? Is it haptics? By the way, in terms of in terms of trying it, uh, you know, um, we can I can share email address and we can probably work out a way to do a demo. But yes, would you like to do a demo at the XR Access Symposium? Um, yeah, I can I can talk to my colleagues and <laughs> see what's possible. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, Symposium news coming soon. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I actually that's great. I, Shira, I wanted to uh, invite Shuri to speak real quicker because I um, I know we kind of skipped over you a little bit earlier, but Shuri, I, I'd, I'd love to give you a chance to chat about some of the, what we're doing for the uh, NSF Accelerator project. Yeah, thanks, Dylan. Um, I put it in the chat, but I know that's not the most accessible channel. Um, I love the conversation. First of all, thank you so much for all of the thoughts. And I'm a couple of things came to mind that connected to some of the ongoing work that we have on XR accessibility, on VR accessibility specifically, um, and on social cues, making social cues accessible. Uh, we're looking at how to use haptics to make certain um, nonverbal cues like gaze accessible to people with visual impairments who might, might not be able to see others gaze. And it's been a very interesting challenge because there's so much information that you get by looking at people's gaze in different circumstances, whether it's, um, you know, people standing around a room and trying to find someone to talk to, whether it's just having a conversation with someone and looking to see whether they're still paying attention to you, whether they're examining your shoes or I don't know what. 
Um, if you're giving a presentation, you're trying to see if people are paying attention, you know, gaze and expression is all a part of it. Um, and it's, we're working with uh, the Quest 2s right now, and it's kind of a limited design space in terms of haptics, because all we have really is vibration on the controllers. But um, it still seems to be the most promising approach because it gives you that sort of peripheral understanding of what's going on, just like the visual uh, perception of gaze would. So I just wanted to throw that out there. That's a work in progress. So I don't have a whole lot to say about it at this point. Um, just that we're we're working on this and that, and those are some of the challenges that we've come across. Uh, interesting. Thank you, Sherry. Um, XR Access is definitely working on a lot of really cool um, projects, and I'm sure we'll see more to come from uh, Dylan, Sherry, and the team. Um, I want to make sure uh, everyone who is raising their hand gets a, a chance to kind of pitch something to the to the group. So, uh, uh, Lysette, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, I see I see you up. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, it's great to be here. Just to very quickly say a little bit about myself for my, for my question. Um, so I've just recently started working as a research assistant at the University of Glasgow on um, a project funded by Meta looking at the r and in education, and I'm sort of looking at the accessibility aspects of that. Um, and I do that having just recently finished my PhD in philosophy in a somewhat related area, but um, not exactly the same. So uh, the r and AR is a little bit of a, a new area for me, but I am uh, blind myself, so I do have some sort of personal experience, and that's where I was come, coming from with this question, um, or this point, which is that um, I know that over the years, um, people have made uh, smart canes, white canes that incorporate um, haptic feedback, so maybe, you know, the cane handle will vibrate when it uh, detects it as an obstacle, and this kind of stuff's been around for a while. I remember trying one out about 15 or so years ago called the Ultra Cane. And this has been tried a few times and people can sometimes be, uh, a lot of blind people can be a bit resistant to this kind of technology. The reasons being, uh, for one, if it rains, your cane stops working because all the tech is in the handle and it's exposed to the elements. So can't deal with sort of weather. And then sometimes it's just sort of so much information that's not really being differentiated like um so it's sort of vibrating like but if you're like in a busy uh train station or something it's just gonna be vibrating constantly um so the feedback's kind of not gonna be um that useful because it's just gonna be totally undifferentiated um so I'm, i suppose i'm just asking generally um when we're thinking about you know things like you know augmenting the physical world with haptics and vibrations um i mean is, is this kind of thing things that are being thought about like how to you know protect your gear from the elements and set it up and how to differentiate yeah i suppose i'm just generally wondering if people have thought about some of the concerns that people have about haptics and smart canes and how um to kind of overcome them and, and improve on that kind of technology with the stuff that's being developed now Yeah, that's a that's a great um, question. And Lisette, I think it'd be wonderful to yeah, hear more about uh, your own kind of like discoveries and adventures, hopefully, uh, when you can, because um, that's a really exciting space. I think in terms of um, advancements, absolutely. Kind of like with smartphones, there's going to be kind of like small advancements that make sense in terms of haptics tech specifically. Um, companies are looking more into things like reducing uh, power. So using technologies that don't take as much power. So you don't need to really change a form factor to, to make sense for what you're trying to achieve. Um, and there's also, um, shoot, what was the other point I was going to make? There's power and, oh, um, uh, weather resistance. That is also a critical one. If something doesn't work because it's not weather resistant, that doesn't make sense. And I think the automotive space is going to help this because in the automotive space, there's like very specific temperature thresholds that um, technology needs to meet. There's also very specific um, weather related activities that the motor has to uh, hold to. So I think because of different industries, we'll see advancements in um, accessibility just as a trickle effect of just how uh, these other areas are advancing. 
but yeah, the really, really great question. An additional thought there would be that cost is a big deal because I think as a cane user myself, I, um, I destroy that, well, not really destroy, but it's easy to damage you know, cane in car door, cane in door, tripping it over, other people tripping. All kinds of things happen to canes and have something that is expensive playing in that role is also a bit of a challenge. So I think that's something that have to be considered. I think there's going to be a lot of research needed about the um, the end use of a lot of these products and how they live up to Glaswegian weather, for example. I can see that being a, a, a bit of a challenge for a lot of, uh, of our uh, accessible devices. All these situated knowledges. Um, I'd love to, to call on, uh, is it Jorn Eichhorn here? I was heading up for a while, and then uh, Nuno after that. Yes, that's right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I've got a question. Um, you've talked a lot about um, physical um, devices, but neuro neurologists um, have tested that you can easily trick the brain to think you are doing something, but actually you're just thinking you are doing it. And it would put out the device out of the calculation. So have you thought about that? And what, how, how do you assess the possibility to uh, go in that direction? Thank you. Uh, does anybody have examples of studies um, that may address uh, Jorn's point? Tricking your brain into thinking you're doing something. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm trying to imagine the difference between just kind of a subtle vibration of the device and, and how you'd use, I guess, just audio or visio to make you think you're vibrating. Well, there uh, have been, I, I can't give you a link, but there have been studies when uh, people were tricked to think they were exercising. And in the brain, it looked exactly the way if, as if they were exercising. So this is why I thought um, perhaps um, you don't even need a device, you just need to trick the brain. That sounds really interesting. I think um, it'd be great if uh, maybe Jorn, you can share some examples on our, our Slack later. Um, I just put the, the link to our Slack in chat, but uh, we, we do encourage folks to, to keep talking about this. I think probably the research network seems like a great place for these types of discussions. Um, that's uh, bit.ly slash XR access dash Slack. Um, because yeah, I, I, I'd be very, you know, it's very economical to just convince people's brain that there's haptics going on instead of having to actually implement it. <laughs> but I mean, I think as uh, you know, Ashley and Bob were talking about the the, the perception is plays such a huge part in all this that um, yeah, it'd be fantastic to get more information on it. Yeah, and I'll just just point out that that from from our perspective, in the short term, you know, over the next ten years, I don't, I'm not an expert in the field, so I won't make a hard prediction, but. Um, but our whole worldview is that the closer you want to get to a, to a natural interaction, to, to something that really tricks your brain, you got to do it by, by brute force, by actually applying the sensations at the level that your body expects it to your body. Uh, so so my, my off-the-cuff reaction as a non-expert would be that, that something like that uh, is similar to, to the, the, the idea that there's diff different haptic devices that are better suited for different applications. I think something like that could work very, very well for a particular subset of, of interactions of, of believability. 
Uh, I also think that 50 years from now, we'll look back at some of these, these physical apparatuses that were very expensive and, and pushed into your body and, and buzzed and vibrated and, and moved you around uh, as kind of barbaric, an, an early step, uh, because it is sort of a, of a crude tool. But it's what we have right now. Uh, and, uh, and I think that the key for, for making the technology accessible uh, back to some of the other things that have been said is, is it really is a match between what's the use case, what's the, the need, uh, and what's the what's the practicality of a particular technology solution. Our, our technology uh, would not be the right technology for a low-cost weatherproof uh, device, even though it could do that. So I, I think that's that's one of the things that's very interesting about this stage of, uh, in the development of haptics is there's a bunch of different solutions and different ideas popping up, and they're all kind of broken around trying to find somebody to pay for them. That's that's one of the big things for a small company, a startup company. Uh, and in parallel, having this sort of conversation where, where what is the best way to, to in parallel, develop the technology towards an end that might not be directed at a commercial customer, but that actually might be a really important tool for somebody with a disability. So, so <laughs> that's just a long-winded way of saying this sort of forum, this sort of conversation, us as hardware providers, getting our hardware out to the, to the community, academic community, the maker community, the people who are very, very passionate about this uh, is all a very important part of the process. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I'd say um, where I see the most, like most of these ideas um, is in academia and papers. And it's like, it's kind of like if you look what's happening 10 years ago, you're starting to see that trickle out into uh, consumer devices today. Um, and in terms of like being able to bring things to market, that's where it gets complicated and difficult because um, a lot of the things we're seeing, like the ability to actually commercialize it is, as Bob mentioned, like dependent on being able to get fundraising, um, being able to have like a customer, enough customers to be able to purchase it, a selling price that makes sense. But at the same time, with a lot of haptics related things, it's like, can you legally put this in the hands of the customers and are they going to get like hurt? Is it like, is it dangerous? Um, so those are a lot of the bridges I see in some of the, like, uh, the bringing these types of things to market is like, it's, is it, can you, can you actually do it? Uh, passing the ball to Linda. Yeah, hi, thanks. I, I just wanted to respond to that as well and, and say that in uh, in the field of physical therapy, there is a, um, a modality, an intervention called mirror therapy that's used as a visual trick to um, basically use, use mirrors and vision to treat pain, phantom limb pain for people who've had um, limbs amputated or lost uh, all the nerve sensation in their arm because of stroke. There is the use of mirrors to show them moving and having a good time with their working limb, and it actually fools their brain into, th into reducing the sensation of pain in their amputated limb. So I just put a, a chat in, uh, I put a note, um, a reference to a Frontier's research paper um, in, the, in the chat that talks about the early uses of mirror therapy in virtual reality. And it's just so trippy and cool to imagine how this could be supplemented, augmented, improved with haptics. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks for sharing this. It sounds very similar to a, a work that's done by an, B, another lab from Barcelona who are looking at empathy use and um, I suppose it is haptics in some way where you have the what you see in your own head mounted display is the point of view of a person opposite you who is also wearing a head mounted display and they are seeing you in theirs. And so you get this empathy connection um, and you have two uh, the facilitators who are um, stroking hands, you know, interacting in a very visual and, and, and tactile way. And it gives you that sense of uh, being another person and, and the, perce the perception of yourself that the other person has as well. So that might be worth, worth looking at. It's something I would imagine similar in the mirror sense. It, Damien, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that. We, we saw that firsthand uh, at, at CES just in January, because I think Ashley mentioned we had a Jenga uh, demonstration, and that was to show collaborative work. So uh, multiple people, each with their VR headset in a common space. 
uh, and we had Jenga set up, the, the game Jenga, and, and you could touch the blocks. And, and our whole purpose was to show collaboration and, gee, don't these blocks feel natural? But what we found is that people got bored of Jenga pretty quickly, uh, and they turned to each other and started interacting with each other. And this is just in, in this quick demo that we put together, it was just disembodied hands uh, and a representation of the, of the headset. You weren't even a full body in this case, but they were immediately turning to thumb wrestling and high fives and shaking hands and interacting. Uh, and I think that really demonstrates that, that embodiment is, is, is not that hard to do. Uh, and the, it, the human nature of this sort of technology, the, the bringing it back to humanity uh, is something that, that is, we're, we're ready for it as, as humans. Uh, and if, if you take that into consideration for all the technology tools or, or solutions for this, uh, you'll find that, that, uh, that again, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of describing things as exponential. It's, it's not just a, a linear increase in the embodiment of something, being able to, to, to feel like you're human in an environment with other humans takes the immersion to a, to a whole other level. And I think that's where um, the future is going, especially with um, WebGL and the, the easiness of accessing these uh, these uh, in technologies. I mean, the work you did is it um, the you, the XR Access did a video a few months ago about where the disability lies, whether the the the, the environment is adapted to the human or the human has to adapt to the technology, and I found their work very interesting as well um i uh, think that that where people are in the similar space whether it's a similar virtual space or a similar um physical space and how they interact with virtual objects uh, and the accessibility and my work in facilitating the accessibility as well as well i think relies very much in that uh, that shared space and uh, to have the haptic um touch as well as the um if you're in disparate spaces would be it would be amazing i mean all right the people who will, will will benefit most from what we're talking about are the people that won't easily have access to this technology as well so i'm very interested in the the side of um open access and people finding out about how to involve um, a whole diaspora of of people in the development of these new technologies. So I'm always encouraged to see this kind of this conversation uh, branching out. Uh, yes, Matt. Um, <clears throat> so I'd, uh, I'm just reacting a little bit to what Damien had mentioned. Uh, I heard WebGL as kind of like a you know thread of topic here. And uh, it's been top of mind recently, uh, you know, that there's standard setting endeavors going on um, for specifically for subgroups like the one that we're talking in right now, but also um, kind of generally just thinking a lot more about computer human interaction um, and how, you know, traditionally computers don't focus very heavily, or operating systems specifically, don't focus very heavily on outputs. Um, you know, inputs are handled very carefully. And, you know, this is typically uh, a one way or one dimensional type of interaction with a computer. And outputs are really handled uh, disparatically um, through, you know, um, plugins or profiles or um, drivers and things like that, not necessarily handled in a unified manner, such as inputs. And I wonder about um, people's thoughts when it comes to just having more output from computer systems in general. Um, I think this is a, in a, in a special, an especially large sore point of VR is that it's all input and the outputs are extremely limited. Um, you know, uh, George and I attend the OpenXR meetings and uh, we do 
discuss at great length that the availability for haptic output, and I'm you know using air quotes that you can't see, um, <clears throat> but um, that it's a very limited data stream. And we're trying desperately to expand this discussion, but I wonder if the discussion is more about output in general and whether, um, you know, we're trying to bring a lot of different types of hardware underneath the single tent, you know, force feedback, electro stem technologies, like all sorts of different things that get sort of lumped under this haptics umbrella. And um, I wonder what your thoughts are in terms of just thinking about it more broadly as an output from a computer. I'll, I'll throw my 10 cents in uh, here because that's something that was very important to us from the start. Uh, and as a, as a conversation starter, not as a solution, uh, I would submit that, that physics engines are, are a, a, a good starting point for universal output uh, because what we're talking about is something that, that could be 2D, could be 3D, uh, could be part of the virtual world, could be part of something much simpler. But um, for example, you know, when, when we and other many other type of, of haptics companies that work in VR, when we need our data, we're getting it from ultimately from game engines and from for the, the physics engines running uh, below them. So we're taking out raw force vector data as an example, when there's a collision between an avatar and a, a virtual coffee mug. Uh, and I think, and that's the same thing if, if somebody was, was using a haptic device like our gloves uh, for, for a CAD system, the solid modeling, uh, we, would, we would attack the, the problem for our SDK at the, at the, the contact area, the physics level. Uh, so, so I'd submit that, that one possibility is to develop an output language that has physics as its roots and can accommodate the very complex three-dimensional real-time changing uh, physics simulated world of haptics as well as as the the complex data sets uh, that are that are coming in and, and expressed in the in essentially in the language of physics all the way down to the much simpler uh, things of, of of either you know like location projection for for a visually impaired person uh, or uh, or a flat screen pixelated type of of system uh, or something that 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 doesn't require the three dimensions but still can talk in that same language Oh, one last note here. Um, who can I share this conversation with? Is this being recorded? Yeah, no, absolutely. This is being recorded. It'll be up on the XR Access YouTube channel um, as soon as we can get it up there. Uh, and again, would would definitely suggest um, you know sharing some of the stuff on Slack. That's a, a great place for the the conversation to continue. Uh, I'll show a link to that one more time. Um, and also in, in just a few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about our uh, prototype for the people project that we're starting that I think this would be a great tie into. Um, I do want to give Nuno a chance to speak here because I feel like he's been done dirty by Zoom's alphabetic hand raised sorting a couple times. Um, so Nuno, go ahead. Um, that's amazing. See, uh, you're, you're right. But also, I feel like every time I'm, going, I'm thinking, oh, that's what I want to say and somebody else comes in. Uh, there's another point just adding to my thoughts. Um, so that alone has been a great experience. And it sounds like your next point is going right in that direction, which is, um, you know, even right now we're talking about output devices, right? Um, and I, I think we can all agree that most of the technology for a visual and audio output is decently stable at this point. We, we, we're, uh, mostly where we want to be in terms of um, fidelity with the real world in general, broad strokes, uh, whereas uh, haptics, uh, if we're relying on, you know, just a piece of metal spinning around really fast or, or going back and forth, um, you know, it's a fantastic technology, but um, a lot of this is still uh, in, in the early days. And it's part of it being in the early days seems to have so many impacts to the the discussion and the the potential for future progress because we're talking about well okay so how can we get feedback on this for more people 
well, it's hard to get feedback from more people because it's hard to get the devices to people, um, right? It's hard to, um, you know, we, we almost uh, uh, throw away ideas that could potentially be interesting just because, um, okay, uh, as the cane with force feedback uh, sounds cool, but if I can't get it wet, I'm not going to use it. So we're not there right now. So uh, maybe we're rejecting a possible interesting future because the present isn't allowing us to, to get there. So really my um, big thought, my big question here is what can we keep doing besides getting money from uh, defense, getting money from big industry, um, besides going the the meta route and uh, selling a headset that's pretty affordable, down costed, but probably also supported through other revenue sources. Um, what are the alternatives to to get the broader user base for what we have now to make the things we want in the future based on uh, based on f important feedback from from current potential users. Oh, this is such a good question. You know, I don't have a great answer, but I'll provide just an answer that I have off the top of my mind, which, um, you know, academia is definitely one outlet, but that's not accessible to everyone, um, considering the, the price of that, of involvement. I think there's other places you can go look at hackathons, workshops as a way to work with people you'd never meet um, in any other way. And it's like a melding of the mind similar to this. Um, and working towards something that you could possibly create into like a end product. But I think I'm thinking like far future, you know, Star Trek, um, where you basically can like 3D print pretty much anything. I think that's kind of the next stage and that's kind of closer to where we're at now. Like 3D printing is quite accessible. It's your easy, you can easily share designs um, and projects. And I think those projects nowadays have even more um, capability of going viral um, because everyone's looking for uh, like some new interesting story like chemical haptics for example the articles shared is an academic project the chances of that going into like retail are you know I'd probably bet against it even though I freaking love it um, but it, like getting exposure um, and then becoming you know not hidden in the dark and people seeing your stuff I think is one way so 3d printing becoming part of these um, you know, project communities uh, where you can actually share your stuff and open it so that other people can build upon it um, and not lock it behind doors. So yeah, not a great answer, but um, just thinking of like other outlets at which, you know, uh, it can enable greater access. And I think it's it's a it's a responsibility of hardware manufacturers, especially for early technology, like like we've been talking about, it's our responsibility to, to make our technology as accessible as, as we can at a given point in time. So right now it is expensive, it's fragile, it's, it's quirky, uh, but we've already had case studies with, with, with haptics of technology, the glove, where uh, at an MIT hackathon, there were two students who ended up winning the competition, two different teams that were talking about using this technology for people with disabilities, uh, for, for um, overlaying complex data sets into, into a tactile language. Uh, and I think that's sort of a proof of concept, even if it's not practical, even if this technology isn't at a price point and a durability point where it can be more widespread. I think having things that people can, you know, Ashley mentioned go viral, that is so important. If, if somebody picks up on this and it, and it goes from, from a industry related, this isn't, this isn't the only direction certainly, but it's one vector, if having, having these sort of uh, bright students take a, a not ready for prime time technology, show what it can be done with it, and then fold it into the academic labs or the, the government labs or the nonprofits who can work on it specifically optimized for, uh, for a, a particular application that is practical. So, I mean, I think that's one very interesting vector to, to getting this technology out there is to just show what it can be done. Don't worry about practicality yet. Just show the, the future in little glimpses and get those glimpses out to as wide a range of audiences as, as possible. Just to add Ash. to that, I think that um, the technology that we are talking about is very exciting to a very broad base of people who would be all very interested in user testing your devices, and uh, you were talking about, you know, those nonprofit organizations there, Robert, and I 
would, from my own experience, completely heartily agree. The amount of satisfaction, uh, the feeling of worthwhile, especially for people who I'm working with acquired brain injuries, who uh, recovering their sense of worth in a community and uh, would love to get involved. And I think there's a there's an opportunity maybe for expanding networks of um, on, you know reaching out to those nonprofit organizations who might have the knowledge bases and the people bases and uh, be able to identify those individuals who have time on their hands that maybe you're in rehab rehabilitation they're trying to get back into life but also can bring their own knowledges and understandings of their own embodied selves to to your product fantastic and I, i'm so glad that y'all are talking about this because uh i think we're, we're about to wrap up here but um there's something uh, i'd like to, to share with you all which is a brand new xr access initiative that is focused on exactly uh, this type of thing of creating those kind of open source code bases and proofs of concept. Uh, and that is the prototype for the people program. Um, this is something that we are uh, launching now um, with a goal of, as I said, creating more accessible uh, open source accessible XR code, creating more of these proofs of concepts that can show uh, just how valuable it is to focus on accessibility for these technologies. Um, this is going to be part of our Accessible Development of XR volunteer work stream, and our first meeting is actually today in just uh, three and a half hours uh, at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, we're going to be bringing people together to figure out how we can get uh, folks at hackathons, folks at uh, boot camps, uh, folks in um, uh, you know universities and, and uh, XR classrooms, uh, and get them, you know, focused on accessibility as a, as a worthwhile use case and a, a place for experimentation, uh, and hopefully share the results of that uh, with everybody who needs it, and maybe get some of them you know, integrated back into these platforms themselves. Um, so we're really excited about this. Uh, we hope that folks will uh, join us. You can uh, email us at info at xraccess.org, or get it the info in our Slack, uh, bit.ly slash xraccess-slack. Um, we're going to be talking about this in the, the ADXR development channel. Um, and also just, again, hope people uh, stay in touch. Uh, you can visit our XR Access at uh, xraccess.org, um, email us at info at, at xraccess.org, and uh, check out our uh, resources GitHub that we've put together with XR Association here um, at bit.ly slash xraccess-github. And we'll certainly be adding some of these haptics resources uh, to that as well. Um, I'll pass it over to Pierce to close out today's session. Great. Uh, thanks, Dylan. Uh, here's my chance to plug XR Access. Uh, uh, thanks again for that. I'm also going to plug XR Association. Um, I'll drop a link to the uh, accessibility webpage on our site. Um, there you can find some resources that we've developed. Uh, we, we wrote an entire developer's guide for developers when they're creating uh, code um, and how to make it accessible. Uh, so you can feel free to download that if you're interested in membership at XR Association. Um, you can find some more information about that too. Um, I just want to thank everybody for a really informative discussion. We have a lot of terrific notes. Uh, we'll be looking out for XR Access to post the content of today's session on their YouTube channel. And we've also talked about a couple of ideas to uh, post a or uh, host a third uh, community discussion on a technology uh, yet to be determined and accessibility. Uh, so we have a great uh, guest list of everybody who attended today and everybody who registered today. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. And we will uh, continue this uh, community discussion because I think it provided a lot of benefit. We had a lot of great discussion. Um, and I just want to thank everybody again for their time, uh, for their commitment and their uh, input into this important topic. Thank you everyone so much. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Uh, uh, good afternoon if you're on the West Coast and uh, good evening if you're, you're on the East Coast. Take care, everyone.